Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's iconic Walk in the Wilderness photograph has become a symbol for the end of industrial Britain. But Mrs Thatcher is walking on the derelict Head Wrightson Engineering Works. Head Wrightson was revered worldwide and renowned for the skills and the dedication of its workforce. But why were they so respected? And what created the extraordinary links between work and community that thrived here for so long? Pride. Every job you done was a pride job. That's why it was a family firm, you know. Because everything you done was absolutely tip top. It had to be tip top. It was a family. All families. You know, three and four and five brothers worked there and fathers. And it was expected that fathers would get the sons in. And that's what happened. It was a wonderful atmosphere at Wrightson's. Well, it was a family. It was a family firm. Everybody got on like a family. So if your father worked there, you worked there, your uncle worked there, your brother, your cousins, everybody worked there, and you went out together for a drink. You even played football together, cricket together. You even played table tennis for the club. They had a nice uh, social club, dances, and everybody met together. And then they went to work together. But I never forget, I never will forget, the, the comradeship in the works. Because nothing was impossible. You would succeed. And uh, that was the environment that you had in those days. Um, and we did succeed. But it was all about the spirit of the people. It, it, the place was black with them coming out, the men. There's that many coming out. And before I started, you know... We were watching, that was then, I was about school age, watching those people come out of work. Never realised we were going to end up in the same place as those people. The works were an unavoidable part of everyone's life. Connie Tunney stands outside her home in 1936 with a cousin and a friend. All three would soon pass through the gates at the end of the streets. Off one, and we were only walking on two, we had two planks of wood, and we're quite high. It'd be as high as this house. No bother, just get up and do it. It was a job, you were paid for it, you got on with it. Plus the fact they only lived around the corner, you know, and you'd fall out of bed and that was there. I mean, you only lived in 36 Britannia Street, you only had to walk down Nile Street, and I was there, you know, at work, so even though I was late. Maynard Wilson was 14 years old when he started work in 1929. I had a friend called Cal Hunter. He wanted to go abroad to work and he had to go for an interview in London. They only asked him two questions. Where did you serve your apprenticeship? Head Wrightson's. Under Sir Guy Wrightson, yes. Right, and you got a job. No more questions. That was it. You got the job. That's how revered Head Wrightson's were. I remember going down to London once uh, on, on one of the trains going back to school. And when you got off at King's Cross, well, there was a huge, it was the entire, instead of the glass, it was a huge panel, um, big, big board. Incredible. And when you got out of the train, you saw that. It made you feel, feel quite proud. A tremendous range of equipment that we could uh, produce. We could turn 27 foot diameter, nearly 100 foot long. You know, there was a lot of skillful work, skillful people in Head Wrightson. 
it gave you a sense of security uh, and I know you know through the the 70s and 80s security came very much with a small s but but prior to then you know you felt as though when you went into a company like Head Wrightson's it was a job for life. It all began on the banks of the River Tees in 1866 when Thomas Wrightson teamed up with Arthur Head. Wrightson was a brilliant engineer and scientist trained at Armstrong's Newcastle Works. Nearby was a railway, plenty of iron and coal, and an eager workforce, many of them refugees from rural poverty or famine in Ireland. Here, generations of baronets and boilermakers worked together to make bridges, viaducts, and piers. In fact, they could make and did make almost anything at the Trafalgar Street Works, often on a vast scale. Many of these products are still in use. But Heads almost wasn't here at all. It was the start of the Great Depression. Two neighbouring shipyards closed, and it looked like Heads was next. It was 1930, and the second baronet, Sir Guy Wrightson, was in charge. In fact, Head Wrightson's fabrication shops were empty. There wasn't a job in. All the men were finished. One for, one, the yard manager was kept on, and the apprentices were kept on. Week on and week off. But Sir Guy Wrightson actually mortgaged Neesham Hall, where he lived, to keep Head Wrightson's open. But Head Wrightson's couldn't provide work for the whole town. John Gilgallan was a moulder at the neighbouring Bonlee foundry. He finished work in 1931. And my mum said, oh, he's got a job digging air raid shelters. Now, that was the first job, digging air raid shelters. And he was in Robert Street, down near the town hall. And so I went down there and he was stood in this big hall. It was all wet. And I said, oh, I remember saying, oh, Dad, you're, you're too old to be stood in there, you know, digging out. He said, oh, it's a job, lad. you know, it's a job. And, and that was all about it. But he died in the November of 39. Being too much for him, probably. Memories of the Depression haunted a generation of workers. As a result, their later expectations of work and life were modest. And of course came the war years and that did change things completely. First few, two or three months we weren't doing anything at all. We were changing over from peacetime to wartime production. And we got so fed up, five of us, that we went to join up. When we got back to work, we had the biggest towsing of our careers. Don't you realise that you're in reserved occupations? You're more valuable at home than you are at the front. So suddenly, there was jobs for everybody. Even married women who had never left the hearth could go out and get a job. Which had never happened since the First World War, had it? You were conscripted there, that or the army. So my dad said, you're not going to the army, you're going to... And right is the one you to go, so go. You'll be all right, we all know. We look after you, keep our eye on you, for your own sake. When the women came into work, they were trained. We trained women to weld in six weeks. Pass a large class one test in six weeks. To a natural weld as a woman, was that lovely light touch which helped to weld. Long hours, sometimes we'd done 12 hour shifts, six in the morning till six at night. And of course, with the blackout, you hardly saw daylight. And then you could go home and go to bed and you'd be up two or three hours because of an air raid siren. But you still have to get up and get back to work for six in the morning. If you were an apprentice, you were deferred until you were 21 in the war. 
Of course, if you ha hadn't an apprenticeship, you got called up at 18. So we had to put a deferment in when the boys got to 18 that were apprentices. And I remember Mr Shepherd saying to me, you must always be strict about these records because remember, if you forget one and the boy gets called up and gets killed, it'll be your fault, <laughs> which put the fear of God into me at the time. Richard Wass was a fitter and turner at Headrightson. Like many other workers, he met his lifelong companion at work. And I'd be, I'd be going in to do a night shift and he was finished his total ten to go home. I'll do, how are you? See ya tomorrow when I come in again. And that's how it was. And I wasn't the only one in that position. Other women had the, you know. And I always remember that. I used to say to people, I don't know if we had time to stop and get married. You know, just three shifts. Then one time, uh, if they were on days, and we were on two or ten. We see them a bit more, but he wasn't allowed to talk to them at work really like, only when you're going in. But the the bosses knew who was pairing off. You know, they knew all about us, what we were doing. But the activity at Heads was well known further afield. The Nazis were taking reconnaissance photographs, and the site was being marked up. The works was very badly damaged in one raid at night round here. All the um, all the, it was blacked out the place. That um, it, it, all the windows were broken and they dropped what they called a parachute bomb near hand, and uh, it blew all the windows and the roofs out in the works. A lot of people were sent home. They couldn't do nothing. All the labourers were sent home. All the tradesmen stayed and got things put right again. I used to do the home guard as well. I was on six or two. You were free for night time, right? You were on tonight. Ten out and a lot. And that's when I was there, when in the air aid shelter, they were all singing, there was a hell of a bang. And uh, the head chief said, You wanted Connie up at the, around the town hall? I said, Well, four said there's been of houses bombed. And when I went up, it was my sister's living with her mother-in-law was there. I was just coming out carrying a baby three months old, covered in rubble and muck. Because what saved her was underneath the stairs. That was it. Well, it never stopped us from working. That's the main thing. We were in, um, in about, well, two days, we were back down our full-time work again. Except we had no roof on. <laughs> <laughs> We built mines, sinkers, bombs, air aircraft hangars. We built four or five of those. We built tank landing craft. And we were turning out a record, 12 a month. That was three a week, tank landing craft. I mean, a tank landing craft alone. Got our lads across from d -Day. There was a great communal spirit among people in those days. And it was that spirit that got us through. Without it, we'd have been gone. There's no doubt about that. We'd have been gone. Hedrightson would play an important part in the post-war reconstruction of the country. The coal, steel and rail industries were all being nationalised and they needed modernising. The Wrightson's personal contacts ensured the company had a fair share of the work. After the death of their father, Sir Guy Wrightson, the third baronet, Sir John, and his brother Peter, faced the huge task of turning the company round. They worked, they were together for most of their lives, strange enough. They went to the same school, they went into the same regiment in the army, at Durham Wright Infantry, and then they, and they both worked for Head Wrightson for all their, their working life really. It was a perfect time if you were in business, in, in engineering in those days. 
there was a tremendous demand. And I think that after the Second World War, and, and certainly right through the 50s, where there was that huge, a lot of growth, and the 60s, they were the sort of boom, boom times. But without Head Wrightson's renowned apprentice school, the company would not have met the demands of rebuilding post-war Britain. In 1952, Heads took apprentices on a trip to London, and it was typical of the firm's paternalism. They met their MP, visited Parliament, a show, and saw an exhibition about Leonardo da Vinci at the National Gallery. The company's future lay with the talents of people like them. And I think if we wanted to man the kind of range of things that Ted Wrightson was doing, it was absolutely essential to take on boys who'd done reasonably well at school, hopefully better than reasonably well at school, and who wanted to be tradesmen. Uh, because without that, at that time, you couldn't man the works. If you served your term at Ed Wrightson's, you, would, you could go to any firm in the country or any firm in the world and you would get a start. Because you were skilled. So we got the place and um, I suppose, you know, one of the things is that most, a lot of mine and fathers is I have one ambition for the son, is not to go down the pit. And so they got me a dead writings. Yeah, and they were quite proud of that. When you were serving your time there, the first thing you did on a morning was on top of the roof doing PE. So they kept you fit before they started your instructions in the apprentice school. The culture then, the, the direction then was get an apprenticeship. But within engineering, I, I didn't know what you know, what aspect, what branch of engineering to have an apprenticeship in. And, and that's why I thought the apprentice school was such an excellent idea, because it exposed you to all facets. And uh, you were then, with some guidance, given almost a free choice of what you wanted to be uh, as an apprentice. And uh, I suppose I was a little bit mercenary and motivated by earning money and, and welders earned, and earned the best money in those days. So as far as I was concerned, I was going to be a welder. The works then, my first job in the works was in this iron foundry. Now the iron foundry was uh, a bit black, bleak. It was terrible. <laughs> it was going into hell. <laughs> I said to, a, said to a gentleman, where's the toilet please? He said, toilet? There was no toilets in them days. It was just a long trough with a plank across. You had to sit on, the, sit on there, do your business. And then they set the uh, set the waste to light. When you went along, and you burned your behind, and you jumped up and you behind. <laughs> well, that was my initiation to go to start to work, getting your bottom burned. You know, your chosen profession was chosen after a long standing of going to different parts of the company, and then your heart said, "Yes, you want to be a plater." So, and, and that's where you went. Well, I said, decided I didn't want to be a molder. So I changed me, I said, right, I'm going to be a welder. Well, a welder was a decent wage. The top men were getting, in 52, they were getting top welders on piecework, we were getting £10 a week. Well, I said, well, I'm going to be one of them. My wage was only about £2 odd. So I said, decided to be a, a welder. Foot, professional football was only getting £10, and a welder was getting £10, which was a good wage at that particular time in 52. So I decided, right, I'm going to be a welder. There was a remarkable school of people, if you like, in authority. And there was absolute respect paid, played, paid by the people who were in the apprentice school to the discipline that they got and the authority that was uh, around at that time. And it also encouraged you to aspire so you had opportunities within the company. If there was an opportunity to grow and the company saw you capable of growing, then there was always that opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to grow into something uh, more than you first set out. As apprentices, we were working five days a week, Saturday mornings and Sundays, and two nights over, and then going to night school as well. 
and we were only apprentices so there was a lot of work around you had to in the early 50s you had to learn quickly because you were doing a man's job when you were a boy Charles Ty's talents found him a post in the research and development department as a welding engineer which involved uh, more of the theoretical aspects of welding and metallurgy as opposed to the practical aspect of welding so uh, that's what I decided to do uh, after uh, a couple of uh, weeks or a couple of months of this I had uh, realised that I could be missing out uh, on my earning potential uh, in, in, in the bridge yard as, as an apprentice welder and uh, I asked the bridge yard manager if I could have my job back and uh, quite, quite a formal interview, knocked on the door, uh, st stand to attention in front of his desk and uh, yes, what do you want? I've come for my job back, Mr Kane. You've come for your job back, you work in R&D now. Yes, I know, but they don't pay very good money there. I want to be back as a welder in the bridge yard. Get out of my office, I'll clip me bloody ear for you. Go on, get out now, go on. So that was it, hence a career in welding engineering. <laughs> Charles now runs a leading specialist welding contractor, but his head rights and experience represented a solid grounding. Today his company, QA Weltec, is a major exporter. Teasdale had all the facilities on site, and it was constantly evolving. They even had their own steel foundry for making high quality castings. But crucial to the success was Major Miles. The general manager had steered the company, often through turbulent years. You could find generations of precise skills at Teasdale. Just one example is the pattern shop, where accurate wooden patterns were made before moulding in metal. It was all done in the uh, bridge yard, which was uh, a complex setup, really, starting from template making, from the template shop, the templates came to the young lads to mark off the beams, the joists. We used to have wooden templates, put them on the beams, pop, popped holes in them for the drillers to drill out. And then and that was shipped to different parts of Ed Wright's and to be built. It was rather complex, but it worked like a dream. And they built this aluminium bridge and it was a cantilever bridge. And the day before, they brought the cantilevers together and dropped this pin in and it wouldn't go in mid-afternoon so everybody was panicking except the fitter he said get about it you're all right well the top the, the top people in they got to know it and he said oh don't worry he said it's only the expansion it's red up day to day sure enough next morning he said bang <laughs> Straight in. And the first things we did, we made tank landing craft. These boats run to the shore, this thing come down and the tanks run off. And they had to be able to... And they were made with it absolute... within a thousandth of an inch. Because they said, would you like to be there trying to get the pin in and, and the bombs dropping all around you? Some of the women workers stayed on after the war, although their wages were often half that of the men. The noise. Oh, God. And, you know, well, what's, what they're doing and what are they doing? Where do you walk and where, can, where were you safe to walk? There was a lad called Shan Stevenson, and I was his mate. And he said, oh, well, just pick that drill up. Oh, you know, heave it on your shoulder and then he carried the, the tube, the, the pipe that the wind would come through. And right, we're going down here to work. 
very few men down there that you could say weren't gentlemen. They were all canny lads yeah, and they all treat you all right. Then my father went mad. He, I w I'd went and got the job without asking him. When I told him, he went absolutely crackers. He said, you, you're just going to tell him you're not going. I said, I start Monday, you know, so... But I absolutely, it was, it was really, it was a really good job. I really enjoyed it. British Rail was replacing outdated rolling stock. Heads built thousands of wagons to replace it. And specialist stock was also being made for export. Kath Harrison started in 1951. Well, the railway wa wagons used to be lined up in the bridge yard. And as you sort of drilled the floor of one, you'd jump out and get into the next one and do that. There'd maybe be four or five on railway lines along the works. Oh, you didn't have any steps, you had to hoist yourself into the, the truck, you know, and then the windy driller would start and you'd held all the handle and then you had to get out and get into the next one to do that, you know, there was no steps. Hid Wrightson developed unique skills in the production of dock and harbour equipment, which began in the 19th century. Oh my God, that was down the, right down the river, on the riverside, as you can imagine, so they were ready to be launched when they were finished. And used to crawl in a hole and round to, to drill holes. So you had all this piping and the machine to pull through. Imagine all the holes inside to get in and where the water would go through when the dock gates were made, uh, when we were operational. Yeah, we just used to do it. I'd done a lot of pressure vessels. And when we were doing the pressure vessels, we had to go down the pressure vessels to do the last dished end. We had the, uh, your, your welding gear, your cleaning gear, your extractor fans, your light. And then uh, sometimes with that narrow, you had to pull it out by your legs. You crawled inside, but you couldn't crawl backwards. Then you had to put a rope on your leg and pull it out by, uh, by your leg to get you out on a, when you finished the job. We're talking about Trafalgar Street now was only 10 minutes from where I worked. When it was Ernie Lister, he said, do you know it's raining? And I said, oh, it isn't. I've got washing out at all. Go and nip home and take it in. <laughs> in 1968, John Eccles became the last managing director of Head Wrightson. But in the 1950s, as a young man, he managed and helped modernise workshops based across the river in Stockton. The experience was useful to understanding the key elements of production. Our shop floor performance was second to none. In the management of that shop floor, which was mainly done by foremen, not by any rather exalted... No, we didn't have many managers sitting in the office. I used to go to see Harry Thompson and say, come on, Harry, how many tons of steel are going to come in the door and how many tons of steel are going to go out today? And he would always have his book and he would know that was the question I was going to ask him and he would know the answer. And if we got more than a certain number of tons coming in and more than a certain number of tons going out, then we were having a good day. So you need people who really know what is going on in detail. And the team I had at Stockton Steel Foundry and the others, they all knew exactly what was going on. The nearby Stockton Forge was a close-knit and dedicated community. It was at the hub of a mining revolution. The Forge designed and built new equipment for many mines across Britain. Norman Tolson, a template maker, worked on many of them. Well, they did all the, all the converting the coal mines. They modernised the coal mines in England and they, they nearly... All the work seemed to come to Ed Wrightson. For the start, the headgears, what we call the pit headgears, were the big wheel. They were all modernised. The cages were modernised. The conveyor belts bringing the, the coal in and out, the, you know, the, the, we used to do all them. The forge had mining experts like Barry Priest, a construction engineer. That entailed really going round different plants that we were building and troubleshooting all sorts of different plants we went to and Troubleshot came back to the drawing office and the works and sorted things out. 
I enjoyed it. It was very hard work because it was a lot of weekend work. I got married in the meantime and we were having a family and it wasn't the sort of job that you wanted to spend your life doing. Although I loved it. Uh, if I'd been a single man, I don't think I'd have ever got married uh, with that sort of job. Barry eventually became a successful sales manager. The steel industry was also expanding. Heads built many of the furnaces. Head Wrightsons provided all you needed to make steel, including torpedo ladle cars. But everybody worked hard, really hard. Everybody wanted to work hard. There was no health and safety at then. It's amazing what we used to do. Building a black furnace, it's riveted where you had to put drifts in and square the holes up and everything. And you finished up standing on two drifts. Well, there was one staging up now on everything, across the porting. Nobody ever got hurt. People were careful. But you were swinging a big hammer, seven pound hammer. We used to see the big boilers sometimes going up the street on the lorries. We wondered how they'd travel. They were so big, they were massive. You couldn't sort of believe the size of them. But yes, everybody, they came out. It was a spectacle. Everybody came out and looked with awe. What on earth's that? And that's what we... Ed Wrightsons, they bought that. I remember that big vessel coming out of Ed Wrightsons and coming up to Trafalgar Street and the way that there was houses, about half a dozen houses, and the big vessel, it looked as if it was going to tip any minute, it just seemed as if it was going to go over into the houses. But I mean, that was tremendous. You see, to get out of Ed Wrightsons, you couldn't get out unless you went over a bridge. So there's a Victoria Bridge into Stockton, there's a railway bridge to go up Thornaby Road, and there's a railway bridge to go down to Middlesbrough, by the town hall there. Three, you had to go out of three bridges before you could get out of the place. But the scale of what lay ahead would present even greater challenges. The prospect of electricity that would be too cheap to meter stirred the nation. Head Wrightson saw potential in the emerging nuclear power industry, even though they knew very little about the technology, and the Wrightsons recruited leading scientists to help them design the work. The contracts created thousands of jobs. We got into the nuclear power industry in a way that we uh, uh, went into quite a lot of different businesses through the enthusiasm and the marketing skills of the Wrightsons, notably John Wrightson, who was always game to take on something new and exciting and was a very persuasive person and who knew a lot of people and he got us into the nuclear power plant company, which was the first consortium we were in, and which built Bradwell. Head Wrightson had developed advanced welding technology, and this earned them the contract for eight boilers, and then more for later plants. It provided years of work for the town. How would they get the 800 tonne boilers out of Thornaby? But it was a work of art, it really was. And that was all due to a, a chap who came in, a new nuclear power. We were going to build them plates small and take them down there and rebuild them down there. And he said, when he had a look at the place, he said, why don't you launch them, take them down by a river and sea? And when Sir John heard that, that was it, you launch them, find out how, and we did and a big success. We 
we had a very uh, imaginative and, and practical uh, uh, foreman called Walter Tranter and he designed, uh, probably on the back of an envelope or on a piece of paper, uh, slipway timbers. We still employed shipwrights in those days and they built a slipway and we all rather held our breath when we saw the boiler on the slipway. Um, would it actually slide elegantly into the river? And it did, so that was fine. And so did all the subsequent boilers. Apprentice school, the first launch, we all had our white white overalls on. I said, You stop there and stop anybody from going down there. So this big car come up. So I stopped this big car. What well, unknown to me it was Lady Wrightson. Uh, <laughs> going to launch it, <laughs> going to launch it. So I, I got me behind kicked for that for, for stopping the car. But anyway, the bottle was we called it the bottle when it got launched. And the tide back. Everybody got drenched, they all sat, stood there in all the fancy clothes and that, watching all the, the launch go down, and all the backwash water come up and uh, drenched everybody. <laughs> that was the first big launch we had down there for the nuclear. And later on, they'd done all the uh, nuclear boilers and they just launched everything. It was a great achievement watching them go down the tees at that particular time. When you're launching 800 ton into the River Tees and towing it out to Africa as a dock gate or something like that nature, tremendous achievements, not seen anymore. Ed Wrightson had as good a safety record as any other firm, but given the nature of the work, accidents were inevitable. And when we're on the machines, there's a tap full of white water to keep it cool. And this one night, uh, it was about quarter five, we got to go home, and they called him Miss Dougie Lund, our charge, and he said, Connie, hang on a bit, I want to see that. He said, move that white water tap, you can move it. So I moved it, as I moved it, my slim overall caught in the teeth of the machine, and you know what he did? He held the belt tight like that. He stopped it like I put myself out. I just saw all your overall and a bit of my skin and all I could say was, what are we going to do? Buy coupons for your overall. Straight down to the bus, five to five, get your coupons for your new overall next week. So I was very lucky then. You see, there was a lot of narrow escapes. You ask how many around the town that's left living now and all over, there's not many old welders, you know. They all had uh, breathing problems. There's, there's a lot of them died very young. It was a dangerous atmosphere at the time. Because the, the, the ventilation was very poor. And the welding fumes, you had no extractors at the time. You had no masks at the time. I, I, find, I find myself very fortunate in my age to be still going strong after what we'd put up with. The dressing or fettling yard. These photos were taken in the late 1920s, but conditions didn't change until the 1950s. The dressing yard was all out in the open in the winter, the men used to have fires to, to warm the tools and just work outside. You know, they worked out in snow, in all weathers. So our 
back windows of the offices used to look right onto it. You know, and especially in the winter when the fires were going and, the, you know, thinking of men working out there in all weathers, we thought it was terrible, you know, but they got used to it. I mean, the foreman was called Ducky Harris because they said he'd work in, when he was on the tools, nothing stopped him working. <laughs> but the early 1960s saw major improvements in working conditions at Teesdale such as purpose-built fabrication shops. And for the first time, health and safety was being regarded seriously across working Britain. For some young labourers though, conditions were often not as ideal as those a tradesman or apprentice might enjoy. At nine o'clock you used to get a cup of tea, but you weren't allowed to sit down, you had to stand where you were working. Why? There's no what, what point is sitting down for 10 minutes, you know, having a rest. Surely you'd get more work done, but you had to stand, stand up. The tradesmen didn't treat you bad, but they, they were on a lot more money. Uh, I was only on a, I think it was £5 a week, boy labourer. And I was doing a man's job. And I didn't find out, it, it was against the law till later on. I had an accident and... Uh, the union man didn't bother putting a claim in for me because the management found out I shouldn't have been doing the job. I trapped my finger in a, in a load and uh, disfigured my finger. When I left, I got a job on the council on the parks department outside uh, grass cutting. And, and uh, it was like heaven from hell. From going from hell into the, the, the boss just said, Here's a pair of shears for your first job. Walk around Thornaby, cutting under the, the street signs. You're a person of the era that you were in. And if you're a, you know, if you're a 15, 16 year old apprentice and you, you come into that, an environment, you are of that environment. And you know, it was an era when you did what you were told, you know, your parents said it's good for you to have a trade, so you stick in and get a trade. And then as you go through, you, 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 you live in the, in the paternal environment, I suppose, of the Headwrightson's organisation. And it, so it was a paternal environment. And the Wrightsons themselves were paternalistic. And this enhanced the lives of the workers in many ways. Staff were invited to a biennial garden party at Neesham Hall. This is the 1932 celebration of John Wrightson's coming of age. For years the event became an expression of continuity and stability. The firm provided popular facilities for the workers' spare time and this all contributed to a sense of community and belonging. It was a good social life. You know, you knew that many people. Some of the young ones decided after the war that they would like to start a youth club. <laughs> so we all they organised a trip to Whitley Bay. So Mr. Mars got to know and he said, Right, we'll pay for the buses and we'll pay for the lunch. And we all had a trip out to Whitley Bay. I mean, anything we wanted, like, you know, when we wanted to start a dramatic society, they gave us so much money, which was very popular. We used to make all our own scenery. Oh, we had some good times, you know. It was all professionally done. We used to have a, a man on the door with his tails and... It, from its very earliest days, Head Rison became international. No doubt about that. You name it, in heavy industry, medium to heavy industry, and we could have a slice of it. There was a piece of action in there somewhere for us. We were just finding out what it was. Well, in the safe at Head Wrightson, 
there were some Manaus Harbour debentures, very decorative and worth nothing. And they had been accepted, ex except as memorabilia, they had been accepted in the days of Sir Thomas as part payment for building the harbour at Manaus, which is a thousand miles up the Amazon. Such efforts helped to put the small and relatively unknown town of Thornaby on the map. The 1875 Empress Bridge across the Ganges in India and its Thornaby engineers were immortalised by Rudyard Kipling. Standing on seven and twenty brick piers, each one of those piers was 24 feet in diameter, capped with red agra stone and sunk 80 feet below the shifting sand of the Ganges bed. Above them was a rail... The President of India, Dr Prasad, thanks Peter Wrightson at the opening of a blast furnace built by the firm. This vast complex enabled India to produce its own steel. Generally, it was like going out into, not quite desert, but not far off. Clear. That's another thing you <laughs> sort of jog my memory. Ken Holm and Eric Brown worked together in India during the 1960s. And we had people from Thornaby working on that site until about 1969, perhaps 70. 50... Head Wrightson's had a presence on that site for some 15 years, which sort of, I think, uh, shows that we really did have some staying power. The, the Head Wrightson team on the site comprised of eight engineers, together with three of their wives. F following that, we had about 100 Indian engineers working on the site, and over 10,000 Indian tradesmen and labourers. The site was very labour intensive. Excavation was all done manually. Uh, we had one, one excavation about 35 foot deep. We had 850 people working on it. They worked as families. Uh, they raked the, raked the earth into wickerwork baskets and it was slowly zigzagged up the top to the top of the hill, about a hundred feet, hundred feet, changing hands at each stage. And the concrete was t taken to the job site by ladies with tin pans on their heads. And for a large excavation, we had up to 200 ladies forming a, a continuous chain, taking the concrete to, to the site. No telephones, three hours from the office in Calcutta by rail, and over 6,000 miles from Thornaby. How did the project keep in touch with base? I, I would write a message out yes. and I would give it to a, a, a junior office boy, put him on the train to Calcutta, he would go to Calcutta and he would pass it to you. Oh, that's right. And what did you do? <clears throat> we, we had to, depending on how urgent it was, we had to uh, put it into form for going by telegram and then send the boy, the peon, to the general post office in Calcutta for it to be transmitted by telegram to, to England. And that perhaps was one of the safest, or perhaps best ways of getting... But it took, in total, it probably took three days. Th three days for you, so by the time I got it back at sight, oh, that oh, was five oh, days. Oh, oh, heck, by the time you got it back, it could be five days plus, yes. In, in which case, yes. if there were any decisions to be made, we made them on sight and got yeah. done with it. Whatever the problem was, it was resolved. <laughs> it was resolved before, before, before got they got the answer before back. They got the, which I think was a good thing in many, yeah. many ways, yes. So it, it meant that if there were any problems that arose, either because of drawings or local conditions, we made the decisions at sites and got on with it. The family lived in India for three years. Their bungalow home was in a picturesque garden, a complete contrast to the head rights and site back home in Thornaby. But they still decided to call their Indian home Teesdale. 
We, we started there with our three children and then uh, my youngest son, Andrew, he was born in India. He, he, he was born in Calcutta. Andy Holmes is now a director of his father's company. Soon he'll be off on one of his regular visits to India. I'd like to go and talk to Tata about building a, a Jaguar plant in Saudi, but uh, I don't know how, <laughs> how prospective that is. But um, that, that project looks like it's, it's progressing forward as well. Um, so I think, I think there's a number of things that we can talk to the companies in India about. Thornaby's global traditions continue through Ken's own company, which has for 30 years forged engineering contracts worldwide. It was exciting, it was so new to us, we, we'd not travelled abroad that way, uh, and India is a very exciting place to be. And, and for myself, uh, I was just a young 32-year-old, so it, it was a place to develop a great deal of confidence in one's ability to do work. You either did that or you sunk. <laughs> In the 1970s, Hedreitzen was still thriving on all fronts, but against a changing world. Barry Priest moved from the forge to become a successful sales manager. Here, he's photographed with colleagues to celebrate a major export to Mexico. So when you identified that a new mine was being built or a new chemical plant was being built in Indonesia, you, you chased after it. All these things go into the development of a plant before you actually get to, 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 to actually bid it, never mind build it. So, you know, you could spend as much as, maybe as much as a million pounds in some instances in, in getting to the point of negotiation. World events took their toll on British industry. The oil recession, inflation, the strong pound of the 1970s, all affected the capacity of companies like Head Wrightson to trade. The firm had helped to rebuild our nationalised industries. Now, they were slowly being run down. We had a lot of it, but we were too widely spread to survive in the marketplace that was coming at us. On our own. We either had to reduce our scope, put all our resources behind a very limited range, much more limited range, or we had to go into a bigger company. In 1977, Hedreitzen merged with a similar company nearby, the Davy Corporation. Ten years later, though, it closed for good. Hedreitzen's today, could, in, in the site that it was and how it was laid out, couldn't survive. It needed you need to tear it down and start off with a new a blank piece of paper. Like the whole profile of Teesside changed, didn't it? If you looked at the fact that there was, the manufacturing facilities were overtaken by, and even today, uh, Great Britain does not have, or the United Kingdom does not have its product or its technology base that it had some 20 years ago. Uh, we've declined with our investment. You don't find apprentice schools like that existed in the days of Headrightson. Uh, you don't find those training situations any longer. Today, there's not a trace left to show that Head Wrightson's works ever existed on Teesdale. Postmodern architecture sprang up soon after Mrs Thatcher's visit. Financial centres and service industry now populate the 50-acre site. But Head Wrightson is far from forgotten. The celebrated local history group, made up of ex Head Wrightson workers, rescued hundreds of the priceless photographs that were lost when Head Wrightson was torn down. The group is organising a workers' reunion to try and gather more photographs and memories for their collection. Telling the story of Hedrightsons is also telling the story of Thornaby. The story should be told, and you know, this is this, and it was a good response from the people who, who actually were there. They have a story to tell.
and, and it's, it's up to us to listen to it. <laughs> We've got a lot more in the chat house than any. There we go. Transporting them up by road, and that's the way that we got the order. He got a job there as a player. Yeah, oh, he he went back on the tools. Didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. Did he go back on the tools? Oh, he went back on the yeah. tools at Cleveland. He did night yeah. shift, and that's all. Albert Roxburgh, a tool room fitter at Headrights, is organising a book with the Teesside Industrial Memories Project. You build up strong companionships, uh, which you remember. You remember them more than you remember some of the rougher times. People have got headrights and connections and, and have stuck together in, in a sense. They've, they've kept contact with each other. Where's he, where's he at now? Where's Harry? Harry, Harry Wardell. Yeah. On the best of, best of Gresham. Yeah. Oh. I used to repair this rude really thing. I don't know who did it yet. <laughs> so the memories and the photographs are being urgently gathered and recorded for the benefit of future generations to appreciate in the exhibitions, books and films of tomorrow. For one day, Head Wrightson will be living memory no more. Stockton Forge, Deep Mental Cricket Team. I'm watching telly in the year 60. That's my father, Jimmy Olsop, who was also in Ed, Ed Wrightson's band in 1953. I always remember with the Bradwell Boilers. Every time they launched the Bradwell Boiler, or even Doc Gates, he used to take me down and watch the launches. But then years later, I worked on the Doc Gates myself. Worked quite a number of years on them, up until he retired of Ill Health. I think he was 63 when he retired, because of Ill Health. Ed Wrightson and its workers have left a remarkable legacy, but often it's hidden or out of sight. The fabrication of Waterloo Station is a good example. The first baronet, Sir Thomas Wrightson, was involved in the original London Underground. A century later, Ed Wrightson have provided much of the tunnel casing for the Victoria Line. The same expertise was used in Brazil for the San Paulo Underground and many other tunnels. Ed Wrightson's workers built the massive Mark I radio telescope at Jodrell Bank. Astley Green Pithead dates from 1898. This is the gang from Thornaby constructing it. Today, Astley Green is the only pit in Lancashire to survive and it's been lovingly restored to a heritage centre by enthusiasts. And this is Fulham Bridge, but few of the local residents would ever imagine that this famous London landmark originated in Thornaby-on-Tees. <laughs>